Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about high feed end mills. Before we get started, I want to give a shout out and say thank you to both Sile Machine Tool down in Houston, Texas, and of course all of my Patreon supporters that make these videos uh, free of ads and without interruption through their uh, duration. A few years ago, I had my very first vertical machining center and it wasn't super rigid and I needed to reach down pretty far because we were making mold cavities. I'm sure I don't have to tell you, if you've got any experience machining, you know that carbide, carbide end mills can get quite expensive. The larger they are in diameter, and of course, the longer they are in length, they can get very expensive. After speaking to my brother-in-law back in the Midwest, he recommended that I get in touch with the guys over at Kyocera, so I did, and I bought a mini Raptor. It's either a micro or a mini Raptor, I can't remember, but it's a three quarter inch diameter high feed end mill. And if you're unfamiliar with high feed end mills, the, the theory is pretty straightforward. You take a very wide cut that's very, very shallow and the cutter moves very fast through the material. 99, maybe not 99, maybe like 95% of what we cut here in the shop is P20 tool steel. It's a very common, easy to machine tool steel for injection molds and, and such. It's easy to polish, it can be welded. That's just what I've used. When I originally started having our tools made by other vendors, that's what I used. So when we moved it in house, that's what we decided to continue on with. When we got the X7, I was actually pretty surprised, pleasantly surprised with how rigid the machine actually is. The epoxy granite frame, it seems to dampen vibration pretty good. There are still some circumstances where you can induce chatter, and we're going to talk about that more in upcoming videos. Once I realized how accurate the X7 was and how capable it was, I decided that we were going to start doing some of our cavity roughing right here on the X7. It's not the fastest, it's not as fast as a 30 horsepower you know, 10,000 pound uh, vertical machining center, but it is quite accurate and it is quite rigid. And I knew that if we could combine the speed and rigidity of this little X7 with a high feed end mill, that we'd have a pretty effective solution, maybe not the fastest ever, but we'd have an effective solution for at the very least roughing all of our cores and cavities before we took them to either grinding or whatever, we, however we chose to finish them in the, in the later steps. Come to find out, we've actually been able to finish some of our mold components because of the accuracy of the machine, which we'll talk about uh, later on down the road. But today, the purpose of this video was really for me to do a little bit of a show and tell and show you guys some of the high feed cutters I've used. If you watched any of the, uh, my previous videos where we had to rescue the drill bit and stuff like that, you may have seen some of the high feed end mills used to cut around a drill bit to rescue a mold base. So without further ado, come on over to the workbench and together, We'll take a look at a variety of the different cutters that I use. I'll show you some of the ones that are still in Cat 40 tool holders from my previous Haas machines, and then we'll talk about the cutters that I actually use right here in the X7. All right, so you can see we've got a bunch of cutters here on the table. Let me get some of these out of the way, and we'll cover these kind of, kind of in order. I'm a huge fan of these high feed end mills. There are so many considerations that need to be made when choosing cutters for any job cost, material removal rate, the, you know, being able to make sure that you can cut the geometry effectively. And some, of course, the holders, I mean, there's, there's one of the things I really love about CNC machining is that it's kind of like this never ending high school physics problem. The work holding, the tool holding, the feeds and speeds, the stress in the material. This is the first high feed cutter I ever purchased. This is the one that I got from Kyocera. And just to show you how much of a noob I was, I shrunk it into this, this very nice Heimer shrink holder. And I actually don't have a shrink machine that's actually strong enough to get it out even if I wanted to. For the record, I never planned on taking it out, but I couldn't even if I wanted to without sending it off to someone with a really powerful shrink machine. You, you may be able to see some of the holes that are down in there. I know there's not a lot of light, but there are holes down in there so that you can run through tool air blast or through tool through spindle coolant. It's not uncommon with these, these tools that have steel bodies and carbide tips. It's not uncommon to run through tool air blast, but you got to be careful running through spindle coolant because if you really get super aggressive, you, it's more common to chip and insert with flood coolant than it is with uh, TSC, but it can be done. But this is the first one I ever did. It doesn't have a tremendous amount of reach. I don't know. I think that's about two inches or maybe 1.8 inches. And it's a three quarter inch diameter tool, but it worked great. Still works great. You see there's no pull stud in it because we don't have a Cat 40 machine in the shop. 
But when we do get a Cat 40 machine, that thing will be going back into action right away. This was another one. This is from uh, Lakeshore Carbide. And this is another little, let's see if we can get this thing to focus. This is another three flute. I believe this is about, ooh, maybe 277. It's not quite 300 thousandths, but it has a lot more reach for a, such a small diameter. So when you're cutting a pocket or something like that, or you're clearing out the bottom of a feature, this has a lot of reach relative to the diameter. So if you have a tight radius in a pocket, it works really, really, really well. Both of those tools have obviously never been ran in the X7, their Cat 40 tools. But let me show you tools that I have ran and, and, and run a lot. I would say the number one tool that I run is probably this DiJet. That's D-I hyphen J-E-T. It's a Japanese company from what I understand, and you can get these in a variety of different locations. I bought this one from a machine tool builder here in the United States. If you just Google D-I hyphen J-E-T, you can find these all over the place. And what's interesting is if you look carefully, you can see this one's starting to get some wear on it because I, I use it a lot. You can buy all kinds of different inserts. You can buy inserts that are for really rough and terrible cutting conditions, things that have lots of interruptions and are very, very hard, say Rockwell 40 or 50 or better. Or you can find stuff that actually does shoulder milling so that if you need to go around a boss or a feature on its perimeter, or like maybe bring a boron size that's very deep and you don't have a boring head, you can use something like this. And the reason I love this is because of just really how universal it is. I have found that far and away out of all of the cutting tools that I use in the X7, this is my favorite for a variety of reasons. Reach, material removal rate, and cost effectiveness. Instead of buying a brand new end mill that's all carbide, something like we just saw over here, this is about 10 bucks per cutting edge. I'm sorry, 10 bucks per insert, and each insert has two cutting edges. So this is on the medium arbor, and this is the one that I run quite a bit. I have a very, very short arbor, which I very rarely use, and we'll talk about that later with the X7. The X7 will only get the spindle, I don't know, maybe six inches or so from the table. So when I have something sitting high up in a vise, I'll choke up on this if I, if I can, and if I can't, then I use this one. And then my last resort, if I absolutely have to, is to run the longest possible arbor. And you can see this one has definitely got some, some wear and tear on it. I actually went ahead and bought a second arbor because we really do, we really do use this thing a lot. Now this isn't cheap. This cutter, the, the body for this cutter alone right here, the cutting head is about 200 bucks. But obviously you can see I've got two of them and a whole host of, of the holders. So it's definitely, this is definitely a, a case of I've put my money where my mouth is. I've purchased all the stuff with my own money and I would purchase it again today if I didn't have it because of how effective it is. And for those of you asking, yes, you can cut aluminum and soft non-ferrous materials, uh, but obviously that's just not what I, we do here in the shop. I'm gonna show you a few other high feed end mills. These all come from, all of these come from Lakeshore. There are other companies that make them, but I've had good experience. And I wanna talk to you about them a little bit. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the holder and then we'll wrap this video up. Here, this is just an inexpensive holder with a bearing nut. I can't remember if this one came from Maratool or if this one came from Shars, but these bearing nuts on these ER collet holders, when you use the same amount of torque, they create more gripping force. And it's not that you really necessarily need them, but when I set this one up, I had one in there. Something to take into consideration when you're putting your end mill into any holder, it's how much clearance you have for your coolant or whatever you're gonna to do to evacuate chips. If you're gonna use air blast uh, from up high, maybe you're gonna use a static line or flood coolant or, or whatever it is you have. It's nice to see on a lot of these high feed end mills, you're using so much feed per tooth. I mean, even on this cutter right here, I think it's like five or six thousandths per tooth. It's safe to use these inexpensive end mill holders, because even if the tool isn't flawlessly concentric, even if it's running out like a thousand, now this, this tool holder does not run out that much, but even if it were to run out that much, you're, you're overloading 
you know, one side by, uh, you know, let's just say 15 or 20%, it's not like if you were using a traditional, you know, 3 16 or four millimeter end mill where you've got two thousandths per two. So if you're running out, one side is hitting three thousandths and the other side is hitting one thousand. And then this is a mini nut that I uh, got. This is one of the, uh, I believe this is a Tagara holder that I got from Shars. I'm a big fan of these holders. They're cost effective, they work good. And uh, yeah, I would buy all these again. But you can see that this is just another smaller version. And again, this just allows you to reach relatively far for the diameter. Something that I think is really important to, to take into consideration about all these tools is the workpiece that you're working on. There are a lot of tricks in the, in the machine. You can pre-drill holes in corners so that if you don't have a cutter that'll reach into that corner, you don't have to have such a small cutter. But the, the primary benefit between all of these high feed end mills is very simple. They don't have a lateral load. They're cutting the flutes, you can see that they kind of have the shallow angle of attack. And so all the force is being generated primarily up the axis of the tool. And so if your machine isn't very rigid this way, most machines have a decent amount of rigidity this way, you know, kind of up and down or, or in, you know, the tilt. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. I'm a big fan of all of these high feed end mills. And by the way, there's tons of different brands. I don't, I don't want you to take this video of an, uh, as an endorsement to any one brand of cutter or, or tool holder or anything like that. I hope you guys know by now that I'm not, I don't consider myself a salesman. I really hope to just share the experience that I've uh, kind of acquired over the last few years and let you guys benefit from it, hopefully without suffering in any, any sort of way. There are lots of companies, YG1, Harvey, there's, I mean, Iskar, Kenametal, there's all, you know, Sandvik, there's all kinds of companies that make all kinds of tools. And uh, before you buy anything, tooling, machines, work holding, I would always do as much research as you can and talk to people that have not only bought the stuff, but have owned it and used it for some duration of time so they have a real handle on, on what they have. All right, well, I know this one's a little bit longer than our normal videos, but I will tell you that I have found high feed end mills to be a super valuable asset. They're cost effective, they have great reach, they have great material removal rates. There are a few lessons that I've learned that I would warn you against. A couple of times with very large mold bases on the machine, we're talking about 100 pounds or better, I accidentally turned the rapids up too high and it actually shifted the workpiece, believe it or not. Even though it was clamped down really tight, when you move it 1100 inches a minute, I think this is 30 meters a minute, so whatever, I think 1100 is close. I probably should do some math. But when you're moving it 30 meters a minute, uh, jerking things around, things can move. And there are times when these cutters have ran at 250, 260 inches a minute in a variety of different materials. And so uh, I would definitely just be careful Take your time. It's always, it's the same case here as it always has been. It's the whole measure twice, cut once, you know, single block your way through your program, be patient. That one extra minute of caution can save you thousands and thousands of dollars in the long run. I hope you guys enjoyed watching this video just as much as I enjoyed making it and we will see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.